four times. So, a few folks online. Yep, great. We do. Um, eight, eight people online. Oh, good. So, um, thanks everybody for coming. I guess I'm going to, as I was just thinking about how to introduce these folks, um, I'll tell two quick anecdotes, just given the title of this presentation. Don't worry, they're not, a, not embarrassing. Um, how I met uh, Professor John Anderson, William H. Drury, Professor of Ecology and Natural History. Um, the first thing John asked me was, what do you want to do with your life? And I'm still coming up with an answer. When I first met Riley, it's the dark of night, a stormy night in the spring down on Otter Point, sort of an eerie spot. And I didn't actually know what Riley looks like until several weeks later when there was some light to actually reveal. <laughs> <laughs> I got to know Riley's voice very well and then and then understood that there was a, a person there. It's kind of like how, um, and this is pretty typical, I think, of uh, the world of birds and people who live in birds is that we start out with um, unconventional ways of meeting, whether that's um, the perils of field work or that's the perils of deep questions from the get-go. I met you in the dark of night too, actually. <laughs> Different time, but same story. Um, with that, I'll turn it over to John. Okay. And of course, I'd be delighted to share anecdotes about Pig. <laughs> That's not the purpose of today. Um, the purpose of today is to give you an update on what we've been up to for the last several months. And first of all, I'd just like to say what a delight it is to be here. Um, we were here lo these many months ago, plotting and planning what we were going to do. So Becky called us in, and Abe called us in, and we talked about wouldn't it be nice if we could. And funding came through, thanks to Friends of Acadia. We're really grateful to them for um, helping us to make this happen. And we actually got to go and do, and we're going to go on doing. And so what we're going to do today is I'm going to give you a little bit of an introduction to sort of the question and the playing field, if you will. And then I'm going to turn it over to Riley and have Riley give you what's happened so far. And so just really quickly in terms of sort of background on us, um, I've been looking at birds here in the Gulf of Maine for 36 years. And mostly my focus has been on island nesting seabirds. Um, Riley started out at COA um, in high school. They came out and took a summer program on our islands, fell in love with the place, fell in love with the birds, and I haven't been able to get rid of them since. And so they've spent all three summers of their undergraduate career doing seabirds, both on Great Duck and more recently as part of this project on Acadia's islands. Um, so again, like I say, thanks to folks, including folks here, for your support and help in us crafting this study and getting it to actually happen. Um, so just a reminder about where we are and why it matters. Um, Gulf of Maine has been described as a very peculiar body of water, it is indeed. I spent a lot of growing up time in the San Francisco Bay area, and there you steam out through the Golden Gate and 20 miles offshore, the bottom drops out of the world. Uh, it gets very deep, very fast. Here, you've got the reverse situation. The further out you go for a long way, the shallower it gets. And so this has been an incredibly productive region of the world, a lot of upwelling, a lot of fish, and that means a lot of birds. And Acadia, inside the black box, um, holds a lot of really significant property relating to birds. So one of the things we sort of set up to begin with was what were we going to work with in terms of working with Acadia? And, you know, a lot of people think of Acadia as being Mount Desert Island, or if they're a little bit more adventurous, it's Mount Desert Island plus Isla Ho or Mount Desert Island plus Isla Ho and Baker's Island. Um, from my point of view, from our point of view, 
those islands are beautiful, they're lovely, and they really don't matter because seabirds don't want to nest there. And we're really focusing a lot on nesting behavior. I shouldn't say they don't totally matter because you do see seabirds around here but our real focus has always been on nesting islands. And so we wanted to look and see which of the KDS islands actually were important to seabirds. Um, we had done a study back in 2013, um, censusing the key seabird islands within Acadia's fee ownership and also um, in terms of um, cooperative agreements with other agencies, easements, things like that. And so we had, possibility of looking at population trends to see whether there have been changes over the 10 years since then. Um, and we're really interested in the habitats on the islands because I think we're all reasonably convinced global climate change is a happening thing. The Gulf of Maine is warming faster than a lot of other pieces of the planet. And so knowing what habitats on these islands are important to seabirds is going to be really valuable for long-term management questions. What vegetation do they like? What about the island's actual physical com conformity is going to be changing as sea level rises, things like that. Um, we'd like to know what the birds are doing in both the breeding and the non-breeding seasons. Um, and then all of this ties into a really frightening question that kind of boiled up a year ago. Highly pathogenic avian influenza has had a devastating effect on seabird populations elsewhere. It's been really, really disastrous in Britain and the continent. Uh, west coast of North America, they're seeing a lot of death. A substantial portion of the total Western population of Caspian terns died this summer. There were ghastly pictures of people wheeling bodies around in wheelbarrows because they were trying to do something to reduce the mortality. Big, big outbreaks in South America among species like brown pelicans. And the really frightening part about HPAI is that it is a changing virus. And so there is increasing evidence it's jumping not just species, but whole taxonomic groups. Um, they're finding it in mink in Europe. It's showing up in foxes here in North America. And there are several cases now of it spreading to people. So particularly given the human visitation patterns here at Acadia, getting a better sense of our vulnerabilities relating to HPI seemed to make a lot of sense. Uh, so here's our general study area. And Acadia owns or has easements on about 120 islands between Scudic Peninsula and the Penobscot Bay Shipping Channel. Most of those are not important for nesting seabirds. A um, lot of reasons for that. Uh, some of them are heavily wooded. Uh, some of them are cl too close to the shore. Some of them are too small. Some of them have other human activities going on on them that prevent that from happening. But there are about 13 islands within Acadia's domain that really are important in terms of nesting birds. Uh, they're not the really dramatic islands that you tend to associate with the Acadia landscape. So when I see an island like this, I smack my lips. It's <laughs> low, it's got relatively limited vegetation, not a lot of trees, and a lot of places where nesting can happen. Another example, um, low island, yes, it's got some veg, but it's also got a nice berm around the edge, and it's far enough offshore that it's going to be a sanctuary for the birds. These islands aren't always the easiest to get to, so that helps because it means visitation is very low. Uh, all of them are officially closed to the public during the breeding season, but the public goes where it goes, and there's limited people power to actually police that sort of policy. So a lot of it's a matter of trust. But fortunately, a lot of these islands are not the easiest to get on and off, and you need to have your own zone and your competent crew to get you safely on north. Species we're really interested in are uh, herring gulls. What a lot of people unfortunately refer to as seagulls, they're not seagulls, they're gulls, and they're amazing. Mm -hmm. And part of the reason why we're concerned particularly about gulls 
is they do associate with people a lot. So if you've got a changing virus that could infect humans, you want to look at human bird relationships. But we're also interested in them for themselves. Um, we find them an important part of the coastal environment. And the number of gulls has been declining alarmingly over the last 25 years. So there's been a more than 30% decline in the number of birds. And we don't know the reasons for this. We've got a lot of hypotheses, but we're concerned. And again, thinking about resource management, um, this is an important resource for Acadia. And the birds are dropping in numbers. So we need to know what's going on. Uh, great black back gulls. This is the largest gull in the world. They're absolutely magnificent birds. They're also pretty efficient predators, but they really lend something to the overall marine landscape that we'd be sad to lose. They're ground nesters. So both herring and blackback gulls nest primarily on the ground. There are reports of them nesting in trees in the past, but most of the time they're nesting on the ground. And that makes them very vulnerable to any sort of terrestrial predators. We're also really interested in this lady. So this is an eider duck, and this is on Scudic Island, the crown jewel of Acadia's seabird islands. And <laughs> eiders are of particular interest in the state because this is the only commercially hunted sea duck. Uh, eider populations have been declining enormously over the last 35 years. And again, we're concerned about the reasons why. Uh, they're not the easiest bird to count. So this is classic eider habitat on Scudic. And admittedly, Robin in the picture is not the tallest student I've ever had, mm -hmm. but you can see and imagine how it is to count birds. And this is an eider nest in that dense vegetation. If you really want to know how many eiders you've got, you can't just fly over the island and count like you can with gulls. You have to get down dirty and actually look at them. We're also interested in guillemots. Um, these guys are really tricky to work with because they nest in deep rock cavities along the shore of the islands. And you can see them typically between 6.30 in the morning and 11. And then they disappear. And there is one school of thought that says at 11 o'clock sharp, the mothership comes and they all go off to Alpha Centauri and don't return till the evening. They're very, very difficult to find and determine how many you actually got nesting. Um, double crested cormorants, uh, another species that hasn't been the most popular in the world, but an important part of Acadia's wildlife. Again, here we've got Scudic Island. There are cormorants nesting on a number of your islands. And these are fascinating birds that, again, their numbers have been in jeopardy over time. They're very adaptable. So this is Black Horse down by Isla Ho. And you can see you've got cormorants nesting right on the ledge there. So this is an island where when we went down there, everyone said, John, are we going to land? Mm -hmm. And I said, no, 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 no. Okay, it was the flattest, calmest day imaginable, you can see, but no, we're not going to show there. Perfect place for cormorants, not a good place for anyone else. Um, like I said, Scudic is your real crown jewel. It's the largest seabird island that you've got. It's also one of the ones that's facing probably the most dynamic change over the next 50 to 100 years. Um, through the wonders of GIS and LIDAR, we can actually look at the island uh, in terms of elevation and contour. And in the study we did in 2013, we ran scenarios of what the island would look like under different types of sea level rise. And sadly, since 2013, the situation hasn't gotten any better. In fact, our worst case scenario is now a medium case scenario with the latest projections from the um, IUCN. So under that sort of projection, probably by the end of this century, you're going to have not Scudic Island, you're going to have teeny little baby Scudic Island and kind of medium-sized Scudic Island. And all that area in the middle that's orange and red, that's prime eider habitat right now. It's all going to be underwater. It's already in parts below current sea level. Some of your other really small ledges rather than islands. Um, so this is Drum, 
and nobody's nesting there right now, used to be, but you get a bit of waves and it's gone. When we did our 2013 study, we saw a pattern in terms of populations. The federal government and the state had done surveys of the islands from the air back in um, 1995. We were comparing our numbers with um, that 1995 base. I really want to stress, and Riley's going to be talking about this in just a second, methodology that you use has an enormous effect on results that you get. So aerial counts work well for some species, not at all for other species. But based on comparisons, we did see a bit of a pattern. The inshore islands were all declining. So you can see here um, Shabby and Heron, Great Spoon, Little Duck, Scooter, Thrum Camp, all declining in terms of numbers between 95 and, and 2013. Well, the only two colonies actually we could find regionally that were increasing were Great Duck and Mount Desert Rock, which are not part of Acadia. These are the two islands we call it to the Atlantic as a field station on. We do have hypotheses around this. Um, so this is a wonderful success story in terms of conservation, but it's also my personal nightmare. So when we wanted to restore the bald eagle, we didn't stop to see what bald eagles actually eat. And this is where I can toss things at Paul Bick because Bick's senior thesis at College of the Atlantic was examining prey remains in bald eagle nests that have been collected for years by the state of Maine, but never analyzed. And what Bick found was that the majority of prey remains being fed to the chicks were seabirds. Um, not surprisingly, uh, when we went to Park Islands, we found a number of bald eagles circling around. Our high count was nine bald eagles on one island. Um, and the number of, bird, of other birds is way, way down. There's no shortage of bald eagle nests in this region now. This is very old data. And it's one thing I can make a plea to all of us. Um, Long-term data and continued monitoring is really important. So sadly, when the bald eagle was taken off the endangered species list, a lot of the funny funding that had been supporting surveying of the bald eagles went away. So we don't really know right now where a lot of the nests are or what the numbers are. But our best guess is the numbers have been rising. Oops, spoil my punchline. Uh, numbers have been rising pretty steadily. And so starting in the mid to late 80s, the bald eagle population in Maine has taken off. And I have no reason to believe it hasn't gone on expanding. And so here we've got this J curve of a bird that eats seabirds. Big surprise that our numbers are going down. No long way. And eat seabirds they do. Uh, we have a lot of observations on great duck and they seem to wait until our chicks are about bantam chicken size, and then they come in and eat them. And this is particularly damaging because in other circumstances, peak chick mortality would occur much, much earlier. The parents have invested an awful lot of energy by this point in bringing off the chick, and now it's being eaten. Another threat that we're concerned about um, is predatory mammals. So this was a photo that Bruce Connery got for me. He did find much to our, both of our surprise nesting guillemots on um, our cliffs. And he put a game cam out and had a beautiful series of really sweet photographs of the whole nesting cycle ending, as you can see here, with a mink getting in and killing the family. As our generation stops hunting and trapping, which is what is happening. The number of fur-bearing mammals is increasing dramatically. And talking with our colleagues in the Fish and Wildlife Service, they're seeing more and more examples of predatory mink going out to their islands. We had three otter on great duck this year, eating their way through the battery colony. So these are all threats that we're concerned about. <clears throat> so with that introduction, um, we went to work, and I'm turning it over now to Riley to tell you what we saw and what we think. Um, okay, so I'll move into the results from this year and comparing things to previous years. Um, and 
So I think we can split our results into three broad sections that I'll talk about in turn. First, we just have the counts. Um, what are the trends? Second, we have this year we mapped nest locations on a handful of islands, which allows us to get at questions of habitat use and nesting density and distribution. Um, and then we have individual birds behaviors and movements. Um, and so I'll start with counts, which are the most, in some ways, the most fundamental and also potentially the most difficult data point for seabirds. Um, so as John sort of alluded to, methodologies can vastly and, and do vastly change the results you get. Um, and so the methods that we used this year and that were used in 2013 look something like this, where you have a line of people and you sweep across the island and people are calling out nests and species and you have somebody recording. Um, the numbers that I'll be comparing to from 1995 were done by um, Rick Schaffler doing aerial counts, so taking pictures that I think were from planes and counting um, what were perceived to be nesting birds. And so there's obvious differences here. For some species, those differences are a little bit less important. So it's a lot easier to see gulls or cormorants from the air than it is to see something like eiders where, you know, you don't see them until you're almost standing on top of them um, or at their nests. And so how those counts compare is much more difficult. Um, so here we have total species abundance through the years, grouping all of the um, islands in the park. And so each little cluster of bars is a different species. And again, take the eider one with a grain of salt because again, methodologies, but there's a bit of a um, pattern with all species. You had a lot of birds in 1995, very few birds in 2013. And now we're starting to see more birds again. Um, and if we take a closer look, if we take a closer look and we break it down to look at um, species abundance by island, we can see that in some cases that general pattern is holding. So on great spoon or heron or scudic, same thing, a lot of birds in 1995, fewer in 2013, and more um, today. On other islands, it's a different story. So on Little Spoon and Thrum Cap, there's just been a steady decline. Um, and in Shabby, you, you have more goals than there's been in the um, period of counts that we're looking at. And to me, this sort of highlights why it's so incredible and important to have multiple islands because it adds a sort of resilience, if you will, where you have, as conditions change, birds are able to move around and you don't have literally all of your eggs in one basket. Um, here is the same graph, but for cormorants. Um, and this is a much more dynamic picture, I suppose. Um, and so some islands used to be tons of cormorants and now there's very few. Other islands like Scudic have more cormorants today than they did in 1995. And I will just point out that the 2013 and 2023, those are probably within the margin of error of each other. Um, and this is something that I think John and I are both sort of interested in because cormorants anecdotally have a tendency to pick up as an entire colony and move to a different island. Um, and when you're sampling every 10 years or every 15 years, the sort of picture that you get of cormorant population dynamics is a lot different than if you're sampling each year. Um, and it's something that we hope gets looked at in the future. And if we can mark individual birds and see if they're moving between colonies, it's sort of changes the picture of how these islands are connected. Um, and here's the picture for eiders. Um, and I dropped 1995 for this one. So this is just 2013 and 2023. And some islands, eiders are doing better and other islands, eiders are doing worse. Um, and yeah, 
And so we can take this sort of count data and put it in con like put it in spatial context by um, looking at distribution of islands through these maps. I mean, distribution of nests on islands through these maps. Um, and this is really something that I'm really interested in because it gets at the question of habitat. Um, and so what are the habitats that different species need or what are the habitats that facilitate different densities and distributions of birds? Um, and so we can take an aerial image like this with the points coded by species and we can reduce it to overall habitat type. Um, and when we look at it this way, we can see that eiders, which are shown in sort of that magenta red, um, are almost exclusively nesting in tall vegetation. The herring gulls in light blue are sort of dispersed all over the place. Um, black bat gulls are sort of concentrated in the center of the island in that interior meadow. Um, and the cormorants are very densely congregated on that rocky shoreline. Um, and we can simplify it once more into like a graphical representation of count. And indeed, the eiders are almost exclusively in that tall vegetation. Cormorants on the rocky shoreline, herring gulls sort of all over the place. But if we look at a different island, so here we have Scudic Island, um, again, we can simplify into habitats and look at the breakdown. And for eiders, the picture is the same, tall vegetation. Blackbacks are no longer nesting just in the interior on Scudic. They're nesting on the berm and tall vegetation in the meadow. But again, herring gulls are nesting sort of all over the place. Um, and one could perceive a sort of optimal habitat from this. So you can look at, um, like if you look at the distribution of herring gulls, you can see that they're much more densely congregated along the rocky shoreline. Um, something that I've been working on a lot in the last two years is looking at this question and data from great duck suggests that there isn't actually a difference in reproductive success or site fidelity in gulls between different habitats. But different habitats facilitate different nesting densities. And so when we look at this in terms of changing habitats, that sea level rise and how that's going to influence these islands, um, we can sort of try to predict how birds are going to respond to that and how many birds will be able to nest on different islands. And yeah, I'd be happy to talk more about that if anybody has questions. Um, but I will move on to our final piece, which is the GPS tags that we put on herring gulls on the Scudic Island this year. And so we deployed seven GPS tags that um, they are solar powered. They talk to us once a day at noon because they link into the cell towers and they're recording positions every 15 minutes, which allows us to get some pretty fine grained detail on what the birds are doing. And so if we look at GPS tracks of the breeding season for herring gulls, um, you just overlay them all on top of each other. It's pretty chaotic. The birds are going in lots of different places. Um, but the picture becomes a little bit more clear if we isolate individuals. And this is where the individual personality of birds really shines. Um, they all have distinct preferences on where they're foraging and where they go. So this bird on the far left is nesting on Scudic Island and is going up to a mud flat at the top of the bay to forage every day. Um, and to give a little insight, that's about a 25 mile trip there, 25 mile trip back. So these birds are really traveling, um, which is pretty incredible. Bird in the middle is doing something a little bit different. It's going offshore a bit. It goes to a few mud flats on the other side of Scudic Peninsula, and it's also going inland quite a bit. And the bird on the far right never really goes much farther than Winter Harbor. So it's just taking seven mile trips and hanging out at the town pier and seeing what it can pick up, going to the mud flat. Um, and, but yeah, remember that bird that's on the far right, because I'll, I'll return to that one. Um, at the end. And so that GPS, the, the bird on the left, we can zoom in on where it's going and you can see how concentrated it's um, 
what we presume to be foraging is. And we can look at this in terms of points instead of like tracks and see it spends a lot of time at certain places. It goes back there day after day after day. Um, and so these GPS tags allow us to look at for individuals what are these really important places? And if we can build up enough information about what's important to individuals, we can begin to understand what's important to these different populations. Um, we can look at a bird that's doing something totally different, um, goes way out to sea, also goes inland. We presume that those tracks going out to sea are probably following lobster boats. Um, but one thing about these GPS tags is they provide you spatial data without necessarily biological context. Um, so you have a position, but what that bird is doing at that position is hard to say. Um, and, you know, that can be something to, I would be curious to look at how we can begin to supply that um, context. And these tags are not going to stop talking to us now that the breeding season is over. And as, um, winter comes around and the birds start dispersing, we'll be able to see where they're going. And our data from Great Duck suggests that that could be as far as Florida or as close as Northeast Harbor. And there's, again, a lot of personality in what these birds are doing and where they're going. Um, and so something that I've been thinking is pretty neat, that bird that only goes as far as Winter Harbor has been doing some pretty interesting stuff in the last week. Um, <laughs> So this is its GPS track recently. And so that sort of congregation of lines down by at the bottom is it going back and forth between Windsor Harbor. And then it did something a little bit against the grain and it went down east and north and it turned international and went into Canada. Um, and it's been hanging out in Passamaquoddy Bay and went way inland um, and went back to Passamaquoddy Bay. And then came back down to Winter Harbor and hung out in Winter Harbor for a few days. And then, oh, is this then, an adult or juvenile? This is an adult. Yeah. Um, and after hanging out in Winter Harbor, it said, yeah, I want to go back to Canada. And it went back up to Passamaquoddy Bay and that's where he is now. Um, and so stuff like this is really interesting and seeing like, what are these birds going to do? It's like a fun game. Every day at noon, we get to see what they're up to. Um, and another thing we did in relation to individual birds was put these field identifiable color bands on. Um, and so we put 60 bands on park goals, both adults and amateurs. Um, and this will allow us, Leopold says to ban the bird is to hold a ticket in a great lottery. You know, you're not always gonna get returns, but sometimes you do and they provide great information. Um, and so we'll be able to hopefully see as time goes on, are birds that were born on one island returning to that island? Are they going to different islands? Do we see birds breeding on one island one year and going to a different island a different year? And that sort of allows us to build a picture of what the connectivity between these different islands is. And you can follow individuals on a scale that's much bigger than you can with GPS tags because color bands are less expensive. Um, and so if you see a bird that looks like this with one of those little orange bands on his feet, um, please, please let us know because it um, always makes our hearts sing when we figure out where a bird is and what it's doing. Um, and Do you all participate in banded birds platform? Mm -hmm. I'm happy to connect with you afterwards. Okay. Yes. Um, it's kind of a free site for that researchers are it's more shorebird related and beach masking bird, but it's cool. It complements USGS. But for, for Paul, anyway. Okay, great. Um, and yeah, with that, I'm going to hand it back to John to wrap us up. Um, um, okay, so this summer we dived the ball. Um, I didn't say any question about that. So last summer, part of our urgency on this was we did see both on Wake Duck and now Desert Rock birds that were exhibiting all the symptoms of HBAI. Um, this is a horrific disease. 
it's neurological. One tends to think of influenza as being a lung respiratory thing. Goes straight to the system and it kills sometimes within a matter of hours. There is now growing evidence that some birds can recover and there are some birds may be immune. Um, one of the really frightening parts about the last year is a lot of us getting together fairly regularly to talk about HBAI and we'd all come with questions and we'd leave with the same questions because folks just didn't know the answers. Um, we didn't even know what to do about bodies if we found them. So last summer, we had a number of birds that we suspected had HBAI and they did die very quickly. This summer, we haven't seen any. And in fact, up and down the coast, there's been a almost complete evaporation. Some cases south of Cape Cod, um, like I say, down in South America on the West Coast, they've been having quite a few. But here in the Gulf of Maine, not nearly as many as we expected. Um, just got a report yesterday and some sus possible suspicious deaths, but the people sending in the results said most likely um, could be a food related thing instead of a bacterial thing and waiting testing. So, what we'd like to do in the future is to continue to be totally on our guard. And we did some swabbing this summer. We'd like to go on swabbing birds um, and testing for HBAI if there's any signs of it recurring. Uh, we'd also like to be doing blood draws. We didn't get around to doing that this year. We just ran out of time. And the weather this summer did not lend itself to being into colonies as much as we wanted. So we're hoping to do some blood draws next year. And the reason for that is to look for antibodies. Uh, like I say, there is growing evidence that some birds can recover, but they should still have antibodies for um, infection. Um, we're continuing to look for patterns of movement and also just general loafing behavior around Acadia. So this is where the color banding becomes very, very important because as Riley says, there's quite a cost difference between the GPS tags, which are $1,200 a piece, and the color bands, which are $5 a piece. They're not free like federal bands. Um, they are expensive, especially in the numbers we're trying to get out there, but they are also low tech, and anybody with a pair of binoculars can hopefully pick up on um, where the birds are. Right now, Jennifer McNamara, another student at College of the Atlantic, is following um, where the tagged birds have been showing up, and then also looking for colored banded birds at those sites. Um, so we want to see whether birds from particular islands are congregating together post-breeding. And we hope to continue that sort of searching around the greater Acadia area all through the winter. And we'd like to know where there's gonna be likely lots of birds and whether those sites actually overlap with places where you can expect lots of people. I am very concerned about the possibility of the virus jumping. Um, we want to see, this is where the tags can really help us, where the birds are in relation to other um, doll populations in the winter. So we've been putting both color bands and GPS tags on great duck birds for a number of years. As Riley says, we're seeing them disperse over a very broad area, but we'd like to see who they're meeting up with, where they're meeting up, and then match that to any subsequent reports of infection. Um, and then I think it's going to be really important, and this is something we discussed all those months ago, to involve the general public in this as much as we can, both in terms of encouraging people to look for color banded birds that helps their full data, but also just to inform them as part of interpretation of the natural resources of the park. Um, the pluses and the minuses of wildlife. And to, on the one hand, encourage people to really enjoy the wildlife, on the other hand, encourage them to leave it alone. So some of you may have heard of our dearly beloved doll, Fanny, who has been hanging out on Cadillac and getting a lot of attention from the visitors. Um, we love her dearly, but we don't want to encourage people to be feeding the gulls. And you think that would be something that was kind of obvious, 
but it troubles me how many people on the one hand will say, oh, it's so awesome. I got to see a gull up close. And oh my God, the gull stole my child's sandwich. Well, you hold out the sandwich to the gull, gulls aren't bullets. So the more we can inform the public about appropriate behavior around wildlife, I think the better. So that's gonna be a big next stage over the coming years where we do hopefully work with you folks including the interp staff um, on how can we best get the message out about this particular aspect of the weasels. And with that, I'd love to hear any questions you folks had and we'll do our both split our best to answer them. Thank you. Yeah, feel free to ask questions. And folks online, feel free to ask questions in the chat also. So if your hypothesis is that bald eagles are in part causing a decline, <clears throat> but if you look in aggregate, 2013 to 2023 seems stable to maybe a slight increase for some species, yet I would presume that the population of the bald eagles would have increased from 2013 to 2023. It's a great point, and it's something that we've been thinking about a lot. In actual fact, our numbers of bald eagle sightings on our islands went down this year. And you know, one question that we don't know, and this is where again, sort of plea to everybody, you know, support the continued monitoring of species. Uh, we know that raptors have been hit by HBAI. And the one question that we have is when did that start? and what is actually happening. And I say, you know, I should be quite so cavalier about saying I have no reason to believe that the population hasn't gone on increasing. I'm sure it's increased since 2008, but how much it's increasing right now, we don't know. And another thing to consider is as habitat is opened up along the rivers from dam removal, does that simply increase the number of eagles or does that lead to a shift in the eagle distribution? I do wonder what the typical food of bald eagles was 200 years ago. Was it as big found back in the turn of the century, heavily seabird oriented? Probably not. I suspect it was much more salmon, things like that in the rivers. The, I mean, going along that, so in the 70s, um, during sort of initial reader, or in initial conservation efforts for uh, and the expansion of population of bald eagles, the diet was primarily fish and alewives, particularly. And then the alewife population crashed. Um, and then when we looked back in the early 2000s, um, it had shifted and just flopped over to seabirds. Um, the funny thing about eagles is that they're complete scavengers and completely don't care what they eat, but just like all birds, they have personalities. And so the eagles will certainly specialize and they will, it, it appears that they will actually pass on um you know these sort of uh preferences or really it's not a preference it's just a here's i know how to get this thing you should too <laughs> and so we see consistency in nest sites um of what they're eating and so where they were able where there was a reduction in one food supply and they're able to switch over to another because they're opportunistic um switching back i don't think it's going to be as straightforward so even though now we see an expansion in sea uh in fish runs, um, if it works to eat seabirds, why not keep doing it? I think Victor Point's a really good one. I mean, one of the things we've seen out in Great Duck time and time again over the years is an adult with one or two juveniles of the year coming down to the colony. And like I say, where they tend to be most commonly going into the colonies um, is um, right when the chicks are almost ready to fly, but not quite. Um, one of the sort of circumstantial evidences that we have for the importance of eagles is we started mapping gull nests on Great Duck when we acquired the light station back 25 years ago. And I was concerned that the station had been abandoned for a number of years. There were a handful of gulls nesting down at the station. I was afraid that our presence would have a negative effect on the gulls. Um, in actual fact, the exact opposite is true. So Back in um, 1999, we had fewer than 100 pairs nesting at the station. This last summer, we had over 800. Um, 
we think that our presence may actually act as a deterrent to some of the eagle predation. We see, as I say, the eagles coming down the island and quite often we're up the tower and so they will hang at your turn and go back up. The north end of the island where we don't spend very much time has lost most of its birds. So, was that a question from the... No, there is audience? a question uh, from the digital audience. Could I throw one thing into the, Yeah. Um, the decline of gulls is not local. Um, so black bat gulls have cumulatively across the Atlantic Basin declined 46%, 68% in North America. Um, and when you have a generalist species across a huge geographic range that's declining, I think that suggests that there's a lot of different things happening. Um, and, you know, food availability in the Gulf of Maine has changed a lot in the last 200 years. Um, and so there's so many different factors that are like weaving together and impacting bird populations that it's really hard to tease out, oh, this is what's happening. And um, I imagine things shift all the time. And yeah, just- a That's a really say. critical and important thing to think about because as Riley says, this decline seems to be all around the Northern North Atlantic. Uh, we pulled as many gull researchers as we could together several years ago for a symposium um, in Germany on gull populations, and everyone was reporting the same thing: dramatic declines. And clearly, bald eagles are not impacting the population of um, Scottish gulls. So stuff's going on. But what worries us is this is a series of common species that tend to be disregarded. And imagine if this was a different species and you saw the level of declines we're seeing in gulls, it would be up and out. You know, a 30% decline in, dare I mention it, Atlantic puffins. And you would have people on the streets waving puffin um, stuffies. But it's just gulls. It's only a seagull. And so it's very easy to disregard, but I think we're gonna miss them when they're gone. So this is a really timely thing. And given the importance of the Cadius Islands to the local populations, it's just a real delight that you folks are interested in paying attention to it. Other questions? Uh, Greg, do you wanna unmute yourself and go ahead and ask your question? Oh, um, yeah, hi. Um... I was just curious, I, I take a lot of pictures of birds in the park and I was curious if photos of, of banded birds are valuable to you guys and if so, is there a way we can exchange uh, or, um, or a way I can submit those? Uh, absolutely, Greg. Uh, photos are always the gold standard these days in terms of recitings of banded birds and so um, I should say photos with geographic information are the gold standards. So um, we'd love to receive any that you get. Um, and uh, I see Abe has put um, a link here. Is that correct, Abe? Message Acadia Lunch and Learn? Oh, uh, no. Okay. So the best thing to do is, um, I would say, email me direct. And I can put your email. If you can put your, my email in there. Um, we'd love any pictures you get, um, and the more the better. And even if you just get um, a partial band, just the color of the band is useful. We're not the only people putting color bands on gulls. Um, so there were researchers down in Appledore that are color banding blackback gulls. Um, Noah Perlet down at UNE is putting bands on birds down at Portland. And we've all got different colors. So even just the color is a useful piece of information. But if you get a picture that includes the letter number, letter code, um, that's just lovely. Other questions? Going back to bald eagles just for a second. <laughs> there was a picture of a map with the uh, red stars. Was that the nest? The that's nest. nest. Were there not overlap between some of those islands that have like no trees on? Uh, the bald eagles are nesting on treed islands. So, for instance, there has been traditionally a bald eagle on Scudic, 
but it's nested traditionally in the cluster of trees at one end of the island. Okay. Um, we have actually had a bald eagle here nesting on Great Duck in the past. Um, my colleague Ian Nisbet has said to me that actually we should be thankful for those two because um, there is evidence that when you've got a bald eagle pair nesting, they tend to chase away roaming immature birds that could cause an awful lot of trouble. So they themselves may teach the kids to feed on seabirds, but in the meantime, they're keeping other bald eagles away. So it may be double in the deep blue sea. For some part of the season, it's useful to have a nest around you. Other parts, it's a problem. Uh, we see bald eagles coming into the colony from a variety of directions. Um, we suspect that some of the eagles that have been visiting Great Duck, for instance, coming over from <coughs> the Long Island. But as we saw from that scattering of stars, remember when <laughs> old day, that's 2008, um, they're all around. Yeah. This is a very, very rich area. And in terms of eagles these days, or so has been, again, I want up to date information. You know, get Charlie Todd back out in his airplane flying for the um, for the sound. <laughs> really, really valuable to know what's going to happen. Charlie's retired now, right? I know, but I think we could learn that. Like, <laughs> like the aircraft. <laughs> Charlie's worked for uh, in fisheries and wildlife. Yeah. Was the seabird biologist. A very brave person as well as a very important person. Because when Charlie's doing his surveys, I mean, this is the problem about techniques. You've got to fly slow and low. It's not just a, okay, I'll take a snap. No, you've got to do it very carefully and hope for the best. Yeah, I was kind of curious when you presented uh, Scudic Island and the projected futures with sea level rise, how, um, well, I guess one, how like that might lead to changes in habitat, and I guess habitat scarcity, and in fact, habitat is kind of one of the main things. I'm realizing that there's a lot of factors with uh, what, what, where, what would initiate population decreases and increases. And so how that's going to look, and then at least I guess, since we're talking about Acadia Islands or those that we have interest on, like will there be potentially new habitats created with, with increased sea levels where maybe it's more of a tree island now and becomes less so? And, and just sort of, if, if you thought about like how, how that's going to play out over the decades. That's certainly a great question. And I was just going to cuss that at Riley because yeah. Riley is the habitat person. Um, I think it's really complicated for different species. So we have the luxury of granite islands, which is not true for all places with seabirds. Um, so some islands are going to do OK. You know, it's going to take, take a lot to wash them over. Um, Guillemots that nest in like the rocks and crevices in the shoreline might be pretty hard pressed to find new places to go. Gulls, I think, are pretty adaptable to these things. And, you know, they'll move up the island as long as there's island to move up into. But when you think about density, questions of density and how many birds an island can support, support, um, it's complicated because the, the really featured landscape on the rocky shoreline is what, uh, I think, is what allows birds to nest in really high densities. And so if you lose that habitat, the number of birds that are going to be able to like comfortably nest with each other um, is going to change a lot. And, you know, the that inland area or that lowland area in Scudic, there weren't eiders there this year because it's water now, you know, like I've been stomping through there and my rubber boots getting all wet. Um, and so how these like vegetation lines are gonna shift through the islands, it's really hard to say, but I think it's really amazing that we have these maps right now of where birds are nesting, because if things do change in the future and we can compare and see what the response was, um, it'll give us a better picture of what's to come. I just do worry me a lot because, as Bobby was saying, you know, they're nesting in these deep vegetation, which are often the wetter areas of the island. Those areas are only going to get wetter. And the eider population has declined dramatically over the last quarter century. So when we first went to Great Duck, 
in a morning you would see up to a thousand birds off the south end. It's a really good day these days when we see 80 to 100. So the changes have been huge. Um, one of the things that I think needs a lot more investigation and recognition, um, if you overlay the map of Eider Islands here in Maine and Herringo Islands, it's almost a perfect overlay. So Eiders and Herringals are sharing the same islands. Um, it shouldn't surprise us as much as it seems to surprise some people. Um, there's a lot of evidence from Europe that suggests that gulls actually act as protectors of eiders. So in Europe, carrying crows are major, major egg predators on eiders. And eiders nesting away from gull colonies do much worse than eider, eiders nesting near gull colonies. So it's kind of a devil's bargain. You might lose a couple of chicks to a gull, but better losing a couple of chicks than a whole clutch to a crow. And it's a really difficult sort of situation because both gulls and eiders flush in the presence of humans. And so one of the things that we have to think about in terms of methodologies is how can we minimize our impact on the birds when we're counting, but at the same time get reliable counts. And you know, again, this is a management issue for you all to think about. Um, critically important when the eider chicks are hatching off that we discourage kayakers from going, oh, I just want to land to take a photograph here. I just need to pee. And eider mothers are incredibly good at protecting the young so long as they're allowed to. But if an eider mother is threatened, she'll leave. And then the chicks get eaten. So having a management strategy that protects these islands during critical periods of the breeding season is going to be really, really important. But we've seen this huge decline in numbers. A lot of that, I think, is due to loss of prey. Um, Iders feed on bivalves, and again, with ocean warming, ocean acidification, and really intensive harvest, there aren't nearly as many mussels as there were 50 years ago. And we're seeing the outcome in terms of bird numbers. More questions. Did you track your birds during and after the hurricane that we had last week? And your, I know you said your birds went up into Passamaquoddy Bay. How did they? How did they behave? I was. I wanted to. I was going to edit our slides and have a little post hurricane. Um, they're all still talking to us. I haven't really checked in on what exactly they did yet. Um, We'll know a bit better later. Yeah. Uh, but you know, again, this is one of the really exciting things, but it's also one of the management issues to worry about. The more we get tags on birds, the more we're seeing really individual personalities playing out. So to say, oh, that's a heron gull, tells you a little bit, but not really as much as we used to think, because as Riley showed you, that's a herring gull, and it's going way out into the deep chasing boats. That's a herring gull, and it's going up to Taunton Bay. That's a herring gull, and it's going to go to Louisiana this winter. That's a herring gull nesting 50 meters away, and it's going to go the whole way to Northeast Harbor. And that's it. Okay. So that's another whole issue. Another thing to think about is, you know, again, I know you folks are interested in and concerned about the question of industrial wind in the viewshed of the park. Um, a lot of the models for bird strike assume single passage through areas on a migration and then single passage on the other migration. Right. You saw what Riley just showed you. Um, there's a bird that's going out past Macquarie Bay, coming back, going back up past Macquarie Bay, coming back. We've got a great duck bird that between September and December went down to New York City three times okay. and back. <laughs> I have no idea what it was doing. And again, <laughs> this is where um, Riley's point about we've got spatial data, but not biological context, yeah. again ties back into questions of interp and observation, because the more observations we can get from people. Um, so Greg, back to you. We'd also love, besides getting the photograph of the bird ban, we'd love to know what you saw the bird doing. You know, was it just chilling in the parking lot or was it actively feeding in the mud flat or what was it doing? The more we can get context for data, spatial data, the better it's going to be. Yeah. And Sean, some of the stuff I've seen out in the North Sea, 
would make me more concerned about that there is the direct strike. But then there's uh, loons, long tailed ducks that simply avoid those areas. So it's habitat loss. Yeah. yeah. Right. Habitat fragmentation. And we don't think about that in yeah. traditionally in open bodies of water. Yeah. There was a fascinating paper at an ornithological meeting I was at a couple of years ago looking at eiders that were tagged tracking coming down out of the Arctic through the low countries. And you could see their track coming like this, and suddenly they go like this. And then they go back like this, and they go, okay, and this is this particular set of turbines. Yeah. And you know, that adds up in terms of energetic cost. So, yeah, you're absolutely right. The direct strike is concerned, but it's also what does that do in terms of available habitat? And again, think about this in terms of seabird behavior. A lot of the time, seabirds aren't just going from point A to point B and they're done, they're circling round and round and round. And I can remember some of you may be old enough to remember um, an Atlantic Ridgefield ad in the New York Times, where is the best fishing in the Gulf? At our rigs. Mm -hmm. And they weren't totally lying to you because you have something in the water. Mm -hmm. It's a site where you're going to get algae developing and plankton mm -hmm. and fish. Uh, so one of my concerns is, is what is big arrays of turbines going to do in terms of food availability? And is this going to be, in some senses, an attractive nuisance that the birds may be, again, circling around and around rather than just avoiding it or passing through once? Maybe, they actually, maybe they're actually going there. So we've got a lot to learn. Well, that's a very good question to end on, um, food for thought. But thank you, John and Riley. We really appreciate it. Uh, so thanks again. Thank you all very much. And again, I mean, just one of the really joyful parts about this is this collaboration, National Park, COA, Friends of Acadia, um, other players in the game. And it's just really, really good that we're all interested and we can all come together over these issues. So I really appreciate this and looking forward to more years of keeping on, keeping on. So thank yeah, you. Absolutely. Yeah. So the, to that point, I want to say, yeah, Eric, if you don't know Eric Styles, you all should.